you know, we, we, we are running a commercial business, it has to pay. Uh, and this is not something we do as a luxury bolt-on extra, it has to cover its costs um, and hopefully do a bit better than that. So we'll have a, a much clearer idea, I suppose, in about 10 years' time when the trees have grown and then we start to panic about what's going to happen. <laughs> we've got um, hornbeam, uh, we've got cherry, which gets very big. Uh, we've got some alder, some local alder. Uh, we've also got an oak tree in the middle between the apple trees is one oak tree. And the way we're going to manage this, there's various ways of management. The oak trees are going to be left to grow full size, so they'll be trimmed for timber management. So I won't ever get to see this, but uh, you know, sometime a hundred years time, someone will cut down and build something out of it. Uh, in between that, the other trees, some will be coppiced, some will be pollarded. Some material will use for making wood chip, some will take to the garden for use there, some will go far. So it's multi-use. The apples are going to provide a crop. Under each row of trees, we've got different combinations of different crops. In the first two, we've got daffodils. We planted 10,000 daffodil bulbs, uh, courtesy of Elm Farm Research Centre, Organic Research Centre, beg your pardon. Um, ten different varieties which we're, we're still picking, that's a crop, so we're actually selling those. Uh, there's not much money in flowers actually. <laughs> Pound a bunch, you know. Ten daffodils for quid. Uh, it wasn't meant to make money, but it does help to cover the cost. Uh, in the third row we've got rhubarb, uh, some of which didn't survive very well. They, they, we've only got about half of them left. Um, they got a bit dry last year. The fourth row is going to be a mixture of herbaceous flowers which we've raised. We've got uh, 10 species of flowers. They're for cut flowers. They're all tall growing species, uh, things like Achillea, Nausea, um, Napphalia, and they're all you know, able to cope with A, partial shade, B, a competition of weeds and trees, and produce a flower which we can sell as a cut flower. So we're going to be doing cut flowers. Uh, this row here we're leaving as a control. This is nothing. This is just whatever grows. Next to it, we actually have a, uh, a row of two rows of artichokes. This is actually what I call a, a long term beetle bank. This has been here for 25 years. It looks crap at the moment, but if you come back here in about six weeks' time, it's a, a May, absolutely glorious flowers and insects, all that's just come on its own. It's a wonderful piece of biodiversity. So that stays as a patrol. And the last row we are just about to plant in the next uh, week or two. Uh, we've raised uh, 250 uh, globe artichokes, some green ones, some violet ones. And they also will tolerate partial shade and also competition of weeds, uh, particularly clo a lot of clover in there still from the green manure. So the idea is to see if we can actually get crops from between the trees. So at the moment we're getting flowers. Um, we're hoping in three years' time we're going to have daffodils, cut flowers, uh, apples, uh, rhubarb, and artichoke. Sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, I can't imagine all this working out totally to plan, but you know, we're going we're gonna to see how it pans out. We're giving up a piece of land here, away from our cropping. And the reason we've got this, uh, this spacing, we're 23 metres apart, and I spent ages trying to work out what was the right distance. I looked at some people that had 10 metres and some had 50 metres, and I decided 23 metres is just right because it fits my irrigation system, which is 20 metres wide. So my irrigation spray boom just fits the whole thing, and we can trundle it up and down this row and we can water one one of these plots we water in about three hours. So it's quite an efficient way of, uh, of, of using machinery and also it gives me 28 rows between all the, the growing <coughs> trees. In time that will get less. We're anticipating that we'll probably lose in total about four meters. I, I don't want this to get any more than four meters wide. Um, you know, four meters wide is, is getting off to set my land area. Uh, I don't want to give up any more than that. If I was a big farm, then maybe it'd be different, but we're not a big farm and we don't own the land. We're, we're peasant tenant farmers, basically. So I don't want to give too much away, but the idea is to see if we can maintain productivity, um, increasing the yield of vegetables. I mean, that's what it's about, is increasing the yield of vegetables through the action of mycorrhiza from the trees, from the, sh uh, from the wind shielding effect, because wind has a huge effect on vegetable production. Really does. And this is quite a windy field. I mean, I planted that tree bank there 15 years ago, it's made a big difference, but it only works that end of the field. It doesn't work more than 30, 40 metres away. So the idea of splitting the field up into smaller lots will reduce the wind speed, increase the vegetable production, and also we're looking at other <coughs> factors, you know, particularly things like uh, pest disease control. Do you know, is there any real benefit in having trees in terms of reducing pest problem? We don't really have any pest 
problems specifically apart from carrot root fly which we cover but um, just see if there is a, a real advantage in having you know greater biodiversity in the field and also it just kind of looks really nice as well I mean you know if there's no other excuse other than it looks nice I think that's good enough you know if it doesn't lose me any more money than I'm already not making um, then that's okay we can we can put up with it so it's really about you know trying to address some of the long-term problems and this is this field I've been using for 30 years it's a long time to be cropping continually with vegetables so we're really trying to restore some of the <clears throat> original landscape features that would have been here in former times in terms of <clears throat> biodiversity uh, we have had several surveys done the, the beetle one how many species of beetle do you know I can't remember it's a lot wasn't it? it was a lot yeah a lot of beetles yeah. and flowers. The flower is amazing because yeah. I, I mean, I look around here and I can identify maybe 10 wildflowers. 168 wildflowers here, and that was just in the tree. In the tree, I mean, these tree rows have only been here for three years, and there's 160 odd species of flower already. So it's quite amazing what happens. Uh, someone else did another survey, they did the whole field, including primitives. They came up with 184 species, wow. I think. So there's a lot, there's often far more diversity going on than you think. You know, I thought we only had chickweed and groundsel. Uh, but, you know, there's more to it than that, and cooch. So, yeah, it's really interesting to get some of these figures coming through um, to see what really is happening on the ground. You know, we, we, we are running a commercial business, it has to pay. Uh, and this is not something we do as a luxury bolt on extra, it has to cover its costs um, and hopefully do a bit better than that. So, we'll have a, a much clearer idea I suppose in about 10 years time when the trees have grown and then we start to panic about what's going to happen. Um, and how I mean, are you managing the rows? Well the actual rows what, between the trees? Yeah. Not at all. Just by planting these alternative crops which tolerate the competition. There's yeah. no mowing or anything. Uh, we're wood chipping. Uh, wood chipping the trees. Just for, well the apple trees we're going to do the last time this year. We won't do them after this year. I think three years is enough. The other trees were done for two years, I'm not going to bother again, they're, they're well away, you know, they're well established, the roots, I had a look, the roots are quite extensive already, so they're okay, we can leave those, in fact I don't mind if they slow down a bit, uh, <laughs> give the apple trees a chance, you know, catch up. The apple trees had a bad time, they, the deer found them the first week they were here, uh, and they got badly bitten by deer, and we've had, we've lost a year basically, on the apple trees. So I'm, I'm still kind of forming the shape of the trees. They haven't really gone through their formative pruning yet properly. Mm. Uh, I mean, you know, without a grant to do this, we wouldn't have done this without the grant. I mean, the Woodland Trust paid for all the trees, they paid for the states, they paid for the guards. They didn't pay us any labour, but I don't mind, you know, we put the labour in, we spent, I think, two or three days planting up. So that's okay, but to have the Woodland Trust provide the materials, which I think came to probably about three or four grand, um, you know, made all the difference. We wouldn't have done it without that help. So, and also the help that organic research centres put in, you know, they pay for sort of most of the daffodils and a bit of the rhubarb. Um, you know, it made, it made a huge difference. I mean, these are decisions which I probably may have deferred for another 10 years without that support from those various organisations. So, this is not an easy thing to do without support. There's no question of that. You know? I mean, as from this year, we've just recently been awarded countryside stewardship status you know we get paid for being organic which actually makes quite a difference to the money we get each year how long it's going to last for i don't know um but because we've got green manure crops and we've got some hedgerow management and other things you know we we actually get quite a reasonable annual payment which does of course help to keep the thing going 